In this tutorial, I'm just going to go over how you can create auto tiling. Auto tiling is essentially where you're creating a lovely seamless textures around your world and that they aren't just being cut off randomly. So they all transition between each tile very evenly. And in this example, we will construct something like this, add layers, and we'll also, I'll also show you how you can just edit it. So here I'm able to edit the world. This is just so you can show that it actually works in real time as well and not just on load, but maybe on load's your thing. Anyway, let's stop with the theory crafting. Let's get into it. So first things first, I'll be using the LPC Brains from Blue Carrot 16, which is on opengameart.org. I'll have those links in the description below. And these are under CC by SA, in case you wanted to know. And this is just what it looks like in the texture and tiled. So we can have all the different assets that we'll be using. So how do we actually auto tile a sort of procedurally generated map? If we're user creating it, we don't have to worry about this because we just simply place the tiles we want and then just load that tile. But if you're thinking of either letting the user edit the map, then you're going to need to think of a way that will recreate the world and have the nice auto tiling or again procedural generation. Now it's a trivial issue if you think about it, you just need to check the neighboring tiles and then which one to render. But in computing that's obviously very complicated because you the computer needs to know what tile that is. Uh, it needs to choose that renders and then you've got to combine them to figure out which is the neighboring one and which is seamless. And also from an artist's point of view, there could be a lot of combinations that you have to think of. So you've got the lava here, we have like this grass and kind of dirty sand, and then we've got this different shades of sand, you have a bit of farmland, and they all need to be able to transition. And this artist has actually done all of them. But look how many different combinations there are. He's going, this is untiled, look at them all. And these are all, each one, they're all little cells for each different combination. This would be very complex because you load the texture, this texture as a whole, all of it, which is could take up a lot of memory on the graphics card, especially for lower end hardware. Look how long it is. It keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. There's, a, there's so many different combinations that so you have a possible memory issue of, of having to load it all in or do you chunk it? And then getting each different corresponding tiles so if it's a dirt one and it's corner and it's got to render this one and you've got to figure out where it is in this texture that you've loaded in uh, to render so that's one of the issues so the easier approach which is less memory uh, and more convenient but i would say uses more processing power is to instead of use these transparent ones so what you would do is let's say you'd load this edge one here and then if you wanted to match it with this like kind of brown grass you'd also load this one on the same tile so this would use more processing power as you're having to draw two textures at this on the same tile rather than the this map you'd only generate one texture on one position which would be less so you have to sort of pick which one you want to do there are various methods but i'm going to go for the more convenient one the one that's easy to program so what are these tiles actually called or they're referred to as Wang tiles and it's a really nice way of creating a seamless world without having many 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 different combinations and if we look at this lovely little kind of tutorial which is using bit masking so this is the method we'll use to determine what tile to render it takes up all bits in our case but if we scroll down it can take up a total of eight bits so there's, there's, here's one method, which is instead of having those Wang tiles is to have these sort of square tiles. This is more for your top down approaches of using it. As you can see, you don't need to have those transparent ones. It will fully uh, cover the world, but it will look more cube like, like voxel in a sense. And in that one, you check its neighbor tiles and each one north, north one is one and then west is two or eight. And once you calculate all the possible combinations, there are in fact 16. That's, that's how many combinations there are for four bit value. And so you can determine, oh, I need to render value five, which is this one, for example. And here is their example that they have, oh, and it has the number corresponding to them. And this is an eight bit one. And an eight bit one, if you would do the math, it would be 256 possible possibilities, but, uh, 
that's not true. It says you, you there are redundant combinations, and in fact, there are only 48 a lot. In our 4-bit mask, we will use marching squares, which rather than check the neighboring tiles, we check the corner tiles, and that gives us a much smoother transition uh, and allows us to get a full circle, full covered one as well, and have these half transparent ones. So this is what they look like inside the tiles are. So you have, if there's two, you have an intersecting one. So for the project setup, I'll be using Python. It's just the easiest one to demonstrate, but hopefully you should be able to do it in any language you want. I'll be using Raylib as its front end renderer for the graphics. I've got Perlin noise just to provide as a terrain, but you could just obviously just create a nice grid textures where you want. And I'll also just be using NumPy. And all it is is a main pie and the, the PNG image of the texture that we have for now. So just to, in the main, the first function, I'm just creating a seed. I'm creating the window for the Raylib, uh, loading the texture, having a camera just so the I can zoom in a bit more, target FPS, and then I do have to generate map, and eventually we'll go through and then render the map. So the fun first function is to generate the map. This is just our Perlin noise function that will bind nicely up here. Uh, this is essentially sort of optional. I, just use, I like to use noise just to generate a sort of randomized map to see if it works on different generations and i'm just using this Perlin noise uh, library that i have for python and i just said the map height and map width really important thing to do when you're doing noise is you don't need to make the map height or width the same as like a resolution don't make it a thousand by thousand because in this case we are generating a texture that is 32 pixels in width and height and so if we're generating a 1000 by 1000 uh, times that by 32 that's how many pixels there will actually be so actually you don't need many a big map to really fill up a whole level because of the texture size so 40 by 40 is perfectly fine to fit in a large screen as well if you're doing obviously an endlessly procedurally generated world then you just want to do it in chunks as like in minecraft that's just a little note when we loop through this map we want to add a plus one on the width the reason because is we're creating the grid remember and we need to add some ones to the end otherwise we'll get like a arching squares that won't actually fill the 40 by 40 so you think about it, there's actually four points per tile in that sense that's why you need the plus one on height and top and so you can correctly calculate it and all this is doing is just, if the value is zero just append a one the value if else then just a zero so this is if it's one this tile is filled if it's a zero it's not and once we have generated that, we want to then create the bitmaps. We don't need to regenerate it every frame. So this is only once the map has changed. Because uh, this would be, you'd be using quite a lot of computation power if you're running this every frame. Even when you implement like some sort of power place so the person can edit the terrain. You only want to do it once the target person has actually edited the terrain. You don't want to be doing this every frame. And this get 4-bit mask is a really simple function this time we leap through but we don't include the plus one in this case now we are we'll check for it in our get auto tile bit as well and all this does is loop through and it gets the value the, the bit mass value with the, based on the x and y and we just append this to our map that i'm just storing in the global context for now and in this get auto tile bit you notice how actually very easy march squares is we just have our first bit our second bit our third bit and our fourth bit and we get our tile and if we just check if the if we're out of bounds so if we get so for example end of the map so 40 by 40 that's the edge of the world and we check oh get tile y plus one well we're just going to check if it exceeds that then we're just going to return zero because there's nothing there and so all it is is returning is if it's a one or zero and we'll check if it's one then we set that dot one to equal one and so on and so forth and then we get the total value by adding them all together. The dot two is times two, dot three is times four, then finally dot four is times eight. And we just return that value like we said before and append that to our auto tile map. Nice stuff. I've done the choosing it. In this case, uh, just as a little thing, I have the possible combinations here. And what the combinations are is, you know, I've named them top left. So it's, it's a dictionary in this case. And I have an array of the X and Y. And this is just what I should add on to its original placement. So let's scroll back down to the render texture that we trigger. Uh, I have a 3 and I have a 34, which I'm adding to the tile type, which gets passed through. 
The reason is, is because 3 and 34 is in fact this grass texture, uh, one of these, and it's in the corner, and I'm just essentially adding on to if I say I needed this one, well I only need to I need to add two to the X and one to the Y. And if it was just like this corner one, then I need to go plus one on the X and negative one on the Y. And this is just nice because that means I can easily add more tile types and I don't need to like make a whole new dictionary. I just need to add these values in. I just need the the starting X Y point. But that is just something that I would recommend to make it a little bit easier rather than having every single different combination with a lot of dictionaries just to save a bit of memory so as you can see got a bottom right top right all our different combinations and in our, in our render texture it's just a way to keep the code concise all I'm doing is again getting the, the the tile I should render and I'm just drawing it to the position it should be at so the x y position it should be uh, plus 32 because the texture again is 32 by 32 so that's why I have the times 32 so that's the size of the texture and so hopefully now in fact I should be able just to just so I just run pavement mind pie we should have there you go there's our world just running one texture have the background blue and there you go and in fact I believe I should be able to run this each time and I'll get a different result there you go the pellet noise and that is really it that is how you just do auto tiling with at least one texture now to do multiple textures that gets more complicated but that's it that's that's how easy it actually is as you can see the line, the amount of lines of code here is only 147 for what sort of capabilities you can do really really nice and simple thing to implement and not too complicated as you might have thought so how did i choose the tile to render well it's just how it should look so a zero is nothing so if the value is zero it shouldn't be anything and if 15 and all the tiles are all the corners filled then you render the full square and you see that case one if all three of these are full then we do that one or in this i guess in this case it would be that case one is just this corner is filled that means we only need to render that corner and so if you obviously could do it the reverse way so if it's a zero it is a full tile and case 15 is not you may just want to try out some some in situations or interpreters might change it a bit on how it calculates it but it should be quite fine and, and there's a 15 combination so it shouldn't be difficult you should be able to visually look say oh this this one's wrong i need to swap it to this one and you know so and so forth but yeah that's that's how this is how your combinations should look in your switch statement so how do we go from just being able to render one tile to render multiple tiles well we have to take a sort of layered approach that means we want to Render something on the top, bottom, middle, and essentially however many tiles you want to render, we need to stack them into a layer. Now, we you might already think of the issues is that this does really uh, increase the computation, but can be be fairly bit depends on how many layers you are. But I have put mitigations in place to mitigate that, reduce it. It shouldn't have a major important performance impact because we in most cases you're probably only looking at at three layers really max. On a single tile or four at the most for each corners so this actually really shouldn't be possible so the the approach that i've done is i have an array called tile layers and you want to create that fill of some sort of value a, a null value ideally uh, in this case it's, i've set it as a none and python's case and it's just the height and width of the map that's what it is it's just a full array of nuns. It could be zero, it could be just an empty string, whatever. Just something we can check to know if it's empty. And here are my tiles I've got so far. Uh, Grassball is probably not a great name, but I was going to use Grassball, I wanted to use it a lot. But... but all I have is Basalt, Obsidian and Lava, and they're just coordinates. Same as before what we did with the grass. And in our noise generation, you know, I'm just checking the noise values. Is it 0 0.5? You know, is it negative one between the two? Choose them and the lowest level will be Lava. It's all the same. I'm this time returning lava, and I've added a key and get all to tile bit, which is the tile type. So that because we're, we're doing a string check, and this is where it gets interesting. Because when we go to get our four bit mask, we then need to loop through our t our dictionary we have here of each tile we want. So this will increase your load times by a fair bit. Depends on how many tiles you have in the world. Uh, you may want to take a chunk approach. Uh, or whatnot because if you had like 10 tiles you're looping through this 40 by 40 array you know 10 times that's that's could take a long time especially on low pcs 
not ideal, I will say. You go through, you generate it, you return the same as before, return the value, but this time all it is is we get the item from the tile layers of the size we have, and we just check is this value none? If it is, then we want to append an array to it, a length of two, and all it is is the key, the tile type we have, and the bit mass value. And then we want to do LF if zero. Remember, because zero is nothing, we don't want to append it if it is value. This just reduces the amount of computation when it comes later on. And we just do the same thing as time we append it because we already know the array existed. Otherwise, it will say, hey, you're kind of appending to a none value. You can't do that. This will obviously vary in your different programming language. So you have to figure out. I, I did do this in Odin as well. And that did require different pros using their maps and makes and all sorts. So it won't be exactly the same. So you will have to figure it out. And so now when we come to this, we are just looping through the key as well once we get through it. So we loop through how many keys are in that section. So it's like I said before, we only check if it's a value. If the bit mask is greater than zero, if not, then we won't add it. So that just reduces a bit of our computation. So we don't, in places where there's just like lava, for example, we don't want to have the basalt and obsidian where values are zero. We're just going to loop through it for no reason. This time I've added a new parameter for our render texture, which is obviously the style type that we're going through but this is this the, again the what we added to the uh, the key which was the x and y position so now we're just doing the exact same thing as before you know just getting the x value and then what the, the y value so it's just determine the position of the tile we want it really is pretty much all the same so we're just reading from our layers and i also added a nice little place tile so that means we can just click the tile and as you can see in order to do that you want to edit the world map so this is the original the array we have for the grid and that's important and then we just rerun the function that creates the bitmap so you can obviously see the problem if you have many many different tiles you're going through and you want the, the user to then click and change that tile that could be a huge detriment to performance of them so that's something worth checking out let's just give it a run to show you what it looks like i've been made and here's our world look at that nice lovely seamless world we have yeah and so if i click we go i'm able to click and place the basalt even if in lava you see it looks really good the important thing as well is that you should also whenever you recreate your bit mask is to clear the array because this is what happens because obviously currently i'm not clearing the array so i'm actually adding it onto it so the for loop when it runs this line here line 106 it's going to get exponentially bigger it's going to completely get bigger and bigger and bigger so just watch this FPS. It might be difficult to see, but it says 60 and I'll, and I'll click it. Still fine. Oh, we just dropped down to now 50 FPS, adding two tiles. Dropped down to 30 FPS now after the third click. Or done 30 after just four. Dropping down to 25 now. 20 now, 21. You can see all 15 now. Getting very slow. Just after placing a few tiles. And that's because getting very, very large now the fix is obviously is very simple it's just to set is to recreate our array and just create a, a local variable that makes it and it overwrites it really and so now when we run it the, the frame rate won't just tank anymore you can see it remains at a lovely stable 60 no matter how many tiles you change however i will point out that there's obviously definitely a better way than to regenerate the whole map when you just edit one tile obviously very easily instead just update its neighboring tiles about or a small chunk was probably the best approach rather than the whole map um this will save a lot of time, especially on lower end or slower hardware they may see a, a very large frame rate stutter if they if it regenerates the map or frame rate dips and so on off or if the player is constantly adding a very large map and again another ideal other ideal situation is don't have a very large map that's loaded and that you're rendering entirely only show a small amount that you need obviously you can store a very large map in memory because memory is very affordable these days and so that's it that's how you can make beautiful smooth tiles now the advantage of this approach is that it's very convenient easy you don't have to draw every single tile combination there is uh, you just need to draw your transparent ones and so it becomes easier to also program that in by just looping through those tiles and then placing them and then also placing the other corresponding tile underneath it to get that smooth transition the disadvantage of this though is that you require more processing power as you have to loop through more arrays essentially and 
let's say for example you have 10 tiles to go through and then you can add them all them when you come through and regenerating the map if we go again back looking at the code if we scroll back here that we are going through the keys currently we have three keys so three tiles that render but mention if you had 10 the world load times will be longer and on the on edit you'd have to look through them all so a really good approach is just to try and chunk them out as well so in this area and then you loop for those keys just to reduce the load time computation but this can take way more optimization but it still offers very cool results and allows dynamics so if i can match this up with any other terrain because of the transparency i don't have to draw every single combination there is it's also very simple to create a, a four bit mask and so I, I really quite like it if you're not doing any don't need to let the user edit tile then it's perfectly fine the load time is less of a big deal tell me what your thoughts have you used a different approach have you decided to draw all 47 tiles or do you just not bother and go for the most performant one is to not even check board just have them as square grids anyway i'll see you in the next programming video